The following will be a brief tutorial on abdominal x-rays, and we're going to cover uh, a little bit about some of the conditions that you may see um, with this type of imaging modality. Now, firstly, there are three basic types of abdominal radiographs that you're going to encounter. Uh, the first of which is the supine radiograph. Now, the supine radiograph you'll see most often, and it's kind of used as a general survey. It can be used in most conditions, such as abdominal pain or abdominal distension, whether you're looking for renal stones. And so you're going to see that quite a bit. Secondly will be the upright radiograph. Now, the upright radiograph gives you specific information, and it can be complementary to the supine radiograph. Specifically, it's very good to look for free air. Now, we're going to be able to see free air on supine radiographs, but the upright radiograph is very sensitive for this, so it's a much better imaging modality for that. We're also going to be using it to look for air fluid levels. Now, air fluid levels are typically associated with obstructions, but as we'll talk about, it's in general a sign of stasis, that things aren't moving around very well. And of course, you can see that as well with an ileus. So supine and upright radiographs form the workhorse of most abdominal radiographs, and on occasion, you're also going to see decubitus radiographs. Now, decubitus radiographs are obtained with a patient lying either on their right side over here or on their left side down over here. And we typically obtain them in very sick patients in whom upright radiographs are difficult to get. Now, if you had a choice between lying them down on their right side or left side, typically we'll lie them down on their left side simply because it's much easier to see the contrast difference between free air and a larger soft tissue structure, which is the liver, as opposed to the spleen, which lives in the left upper quadrant. Now, speaking of free air, let's talk a little bit about some of the imaging findings of free air. And one of the best places to look for the presence of free air is on the upright radiographs beneath the hemidiaphragms. And when it's present, you're essentially going to see areas of lucency just like this beneath the hemidiaphragms, right or left, often easier to see on the right side because you often have the stomach bubble on the left that can preclude you from confidently calling the presence of free air. Now, sometimes the presence of free air uh, may not be seen as a very clean area of lucency beneath the hemidiaphragm but rather as kind of curvilinear bands that are crossing over as air is getting trapped between the different muscular layers of the hemidiaphragm. This is actually known as the leaping dolphin sign because it's been thought to look like a leaping dolphin. One of the other findings you can look for in free air, if there's a lot of free air, is the continuous diaphragm sign where if you see the right and left hemidiaphragms, you can see it extend all the way out across the midline due to the presence of free intraperitoneal air that really outlines these structures very nicely. Now, the other findings of free air that one can look for, particularly on supine radiographs, is the presence of Wriggler sign. Now, in Wriggler sign, you're essentially seeing the outline of the bowel by air within the lumen of the bowel and air outside of the lumen of the bowel within the abdominal cavity. So typically, if you have a bowel loop in the abdominal cavity, you may see the inner half of its bowel wall as there's lucency within the lumen of the bowel due to the presence of air, but you should never really see the outside aspect of the uh, bowel wall. If you do see the inner wall and the outer wall nicely outlined due to the presence of air both inside the bowel, which is expected, but also outside of the bowel, that's unexpected, that's known as Wriggler sign. One of the other signs of uh, particularly a large amount of free air is known as the football sign or the falciform ligament sign. And this is another sign that's particularly seen on supine radiographs as air rises to the most non-dependent portion of the abdominal cavity. So you're going to see a large amount of lucency within the abdominal cavity, and it will essentially outline the falciform ligament, which look like a white kind of line kind of dissecting these two areas of large lucency. And finally, another subtle sign of the presence of free air is something known as the lucent liver sign. In this condition, which helps you detect the presence of free air on supine radiographs, you're going to see increased lucency as you go from the outside of the patient's uh, abdominal and thoracic cavity down to the midline. So typically as you go from uh, point A over here to point B over here, things should get more dense as the liver kind of occupies this space. But if you get more lucency that kind of goes across this area, it's a very subtle sign that there may be free intraperitoneal air. Before we move on to talk about the imaging appearance of bowel obstruction, it's useful to go through how to confidently identify small bowel on abdominal radiographs and how to differentiate that from large bowel. So in general, the small bowel resides in the central portion of the abdominal cavity, just drawing a few loops of small bowel over here, while the large bowel travels along the periphery and almost forms like a picture frame around the small bowel. The hafsters tend to be thicker than the, the valvulae conaventes in the small bowel, and they also incompletely circle around the large bowel. So you won't see them kind of connect for the most part. This is opposed to the valvulae conaventes, the mucosal folds of the small bowel, that in general you'll see kind of trace the breadth of the small bowel. And once you're familiar with that, identifying a bowel obstruction is a relatively straightforward process if the imaging appearance are classic. 
Firstly, it's important to identify if a bowel is distended. For small bowel, anything above 3 centimeters is considered distended. For large bowel, just double it and go to 6 centimeters for distension, except at the cecum, which is a little bit more capacious, and we allow up to 9 centimeters for distension. And when we're looking for something like a small bowel obstruction, we're essentially looking for multiple distended loops of bowel that are greater than 3 centimeters uh, in their diameter. On the upright radiographs, these loops of bowel have air fluid levels. We spoke about air fluid levels being a nonspecific sign of stasis. Now, the large bowel can have air fluid levels as it serves as a reservoir uh, for stool before it gets evacuated. The small bowel should never really have air fluid level. So if you see distended loops of small bowel on a supine radiograph with the presence of air fluid levels in the upright radiographs, and in general seeing a paucity of gas within where you expect the large bowel to be out in the periphery, these signs are suggestive of a small bowel obstruction, for which further imaging of the CT scan is indicated to evaluate for the etiology, whether it's adhesions, which is the most common cause, a malignancy, and a deception, etc. Large bowel obstructions can be a little bit more tricky in abdominal radiographs, but you're essentially looking for similar findings, that is, distended loops of large bowel more than 6 centimeters or more than 9 centimeters at the cecum, which lives in the right lower quadrant, with again a paucity of gas seen distal to that location. Again, a CT scan would be the uh, next uh, imaging modality to get for further evaluation. Now, there are particular types of large bowel obstructions that have a classic appearance. One of this is a volvulus, and this typically involves either the sigmoid or the cecum. Sigmoid volvulus, you tend to see in older patients whose sigmoid mesocolon is very lax, and it can rotate and twist upon itself, giving rise to massive distension of the sigmoid colon. And it's actually referred to as a coffee bean appearance with the apex pointing to the right upper quadrant. Typically looks something like this. Cecal volvulus, on the other hand, uh, tend to see in younger patients who have a congenital laxity of the mesentery upon which the cecum hangs. And in that instance, you're gonna see a large distension of the cecum with the apex typically pointing to the left upper quadrant. In either instance, massive distension of the bowel, which kind of looks like this, uh, suggestive of the volvulus, and oftentimes a CT scan is done to verify the type of volvulus and to see if there's any complications that have developed. So let's move on to some common calcification patterns that you may encounter abdominal radiographs, the first of which are gallstones, and these will manifest as one or more rounded calcifications in the right upper quadrant, and it's important to understand that only about uh, 15 to 20 percent of these gallstones will have enough calcium to be actually visible on abdominal radiographs. So the majority of them will be radiolucent and you won't identify them. Other types of right upper quadrant calcifications that may be encountered are calcification of the wall of the gallbladder. So you may see it either incomplete or kind of a stipled calcification involving the wall of the gallbladder. And this is known as a porcelain gallbladder. And the only reason that this is important is that there have been some data to suggest that a porcelain gallbladder is at an increased risk for developing cancer. So if patients are symptomatic or they're surgical candidates, it's something that they consider taking out. Moving on to a different organ, on occasion you will see calcifications that kind of conform to uh, the shape of the renal pelvis and the renal calyces. Um, you can see this in the right upper quadrant, you can see this kind of in the left upper quadrant, and these are known as staghorn calculi. And a couple of things to know about these is that this is composed of a material called struvite, which in itself is composed of magnesium, ammonium, and phosphate with a variable amount of calcium. And this is typically associated with recurrent urinary tract infections with urease producing bacteria. And they have a very characteristic appearance where they kind of conform to the renal collecting system. Other calcifications that you can see involved in the kidney include types of nephrocalcinosis, which is essentially deposition of calcium in the kidney. You can see it outlining the cortex of the kidney, which is cortical nephrocalcinosis. You can see it within the renal medulla. This is called medullary nephrocalcinosis. This condition is commonly associated with hyperparathyroidism. Now, occasionally you'll see the entire kidney shriveled up and calcified, something like this. That's a characteristic finding that you can see with TB, and this represents a non-functioning kidney that's completely calcified and destroyed by a granulomatous reaction to the tuberculosis infection. Uncommonly, you'll see calcifications uh, in kind of a triangular shape, uh, unilateral or bilateral, and the shape of where you expect the adrenal glands to be. And this can be typically seen uh, with prior infections, such as tuberculosis, uh, hemorrhage, which is an often finding uh, over time the hematoma calcifies, or some rare diseases, just Woolman's disease, a disease you see in pediatrics. Another common calcification pattern 
uh, is typically um, these kind of stippled calcifications that you see running across the uh, abdominal radiograph. And this is characteristic of chronic pancreatitis, often uh, in the setting of uh, alcoholism. And these represent some introductal calcifications that are seen within uh, typically ectatic side branches um, that develop in the setting of chronic pancreatitis. Now, overlying the pelvis, uh, you may see one or more calcifications in the midline, and these can be seen with bladder stones. On occasion, some of these bladder stones may have very uh, spiculated appearance, and these are typically known as jack stones. And the only significance of these jack stones is that they're typically uh, made up of uh, calcium oxalate dihydrates. It uh, seems to be specific for this particular type of stone. Sometimes you'll see these kind of popcorn type calcifications. You may see one, you may see uh, more than one, and you can see those calcifications with uterine fibroids. That will be uh, not an uncommon finding you see uh, within the pelvis. Now other things that can calcify irrespective of location within the abdomen or pelvis will be cysts. The periphery of cysts can calcify, so sometimes in the setting of polycystic kidney disease you see these curvilinear calcifications surrounding the abdominal cavity and these are just the peripheral lining of these renal cysts that are calcified. On occasion you'll see hematomas not within organs but within the abdominal or pelvic cavity that calcify. Um, so you'll see a large kind of peripherally calcified uh, structure in any of the quadrants that are suggestive of a hematoma. And finally if you see a midline uh, calcification kind of surrounding uh, the vertebral bodies, um, beware that this may be an abdominal aortic aneurysm. So that may be an indication to get an imaging study to better evaluate it. And finally, before you uh, finish evaluating your abdominal radiograph, always remember to look at the soft tissues, particularly for the presence of gas. And gas will manifest as lucencies, whether they're linear, curvilinear, that don't conform to where you expect organs to be. And the reason being is that this finding can be seen with necrotizing fasciitis, also known as Fournier's gangrene, when it affects the perineum. This is a very aggressive polymicrobial infection with high mortality and morbidity. So uh, it should be recognized and reported to the uh, referring physicians in a prompt manner.